Uh, great to be here today. Thanks, Cecilia, uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, thought it would be something I wanted to do, speak to Cecilia like that. Actually, I could. So, digital skills is something I'm very passionate about, and that's more from a requirement, I guess, yeah. in terms of actually finding the right people to work in our organization, finding the right people to collaborate with, etc. Everybody here will realize it's very difficult in the market today, finding, finding the right people. If you can find technicians, and you can find some level of practitioners, but to find the modern construction professional, which is a combination of digital skills and construction knowledge, that's tricky. The person is hard to find. So, you know, we either have to make them or, you know, try and encourage people to go on that journey. So, I'm going to talk about these skills yeah, throughout the whole project life cycle. We're going to stand up here representing the main contractor, but I think it's important that anybody who's seeking to develop their digital skills in construction knows that these skills are. Applicable at every part of the project life cycle, right from client owner, be it public or private, all the way through then, you know, if it's a traditional uh, life cycle design, then that's not so natural, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about this modern construction professional, as I call it. So, you know, the tagline I made up there is learn the way and then learn our way. So, you know, by, by that, I mean, learn the way is learn what delivery and construction is all about, what we're trying to do with the environment, first and foremost. And then learn the way to do it. So how do we innovate? I guess that uh, you know, bring bring kind of new fresh ideas of what is a very traditional landscape and traditional environment. So touch a little bit then on, on the academic perspective, and then I'll then close out and just talk about um, you know the toolkits that are there, you know, the class and tools that everybody gives familiar with. So from a client's perspective, then <clears throat> I'll do a lot of text in some of these slides, uh, it's hard to take stuff out and put it in. So I'm boring stuff, but you know, to we talk about digital skills or technical skills, there's a lot of crossover with some of the soft skills that Jeremy was talking about here <laughs> as well. Uh, but you know, if you're somebody who's developing a career at the client level, understanding the project objectives is, is absolutely key. So, you know, um, forget about technology for a second. Why don't we try to get out of this project? And add a touch on it as well. At the asset handover side, what does the client want back? And what are they going to do with that data and that information? How do they plan to process it and use it? And, you know, if it is from an HC perspective, we've got some buildings that are less than 200 years. What are they going to use that good data for um, in a facilities management system, for example? So be a savvy organized client when you come to your delivery team asking for what you want to know. So awareness of big benefits, you know, big is not just 3D. <laughs> I'm still trying to people that, that work that that's the case. It's a different between the information model and the 3D model. So it's more about data driven decision making, which is a, which is a key differentiator. So, you know, for people who are developing their skills in this industry, focus on data. It's good to be able to use modeling platforms and 3D visualization platforms, but it's more important to be able to have the data that's behind it. So, from a client perspective, you know, typically the client can end up owning this data that's produced during, during the delivery. So, if you can develop that standard up front, project information standard is being thing now as part of the ISO. Uh, if the client can, if there's a client that CD and, and that's kind of uh, driven throughout the project, that's also a big help, at least sets the direction of the project early. And then they can validate that information, et cetera, et cetera. But something I want to touch on as well is the RWA, real world asset tokenization. This is the way construction is going over the next number of, number of years. Uh, you know, in the private industry where you are in the public industry where you may have buildings that last a long amount of time in the public or the private sector, it's not necessarily the same. So, you know, some owners are building these buildings to get some revenue out of them and then they're going to sell, they're going to sell them in a short period of time afterwards. So within, within a, you know, three to five years, they might try to actually, uh, hand over this asset or transact on this asset to somebody else. So more of objective valuations that you can make. On these assets, these buildings, to sell them to them. So, you know, tokenizing that data. So, there are companies out there who are basically just retroactively producing digital data on existing buildings so that the client can actually sell it for the price. Okay. So, that's something that uh, the client needs to be aware of up front. And people who have digital skills in the market need to know that as well. Collaboration, expectation. So, use the technology, even if it's straight out of what Jeremy was saying, well, use the technology for this issue resolution. I'll talk a lot about soft skills in this presentation as well. So design team's perspective, this, you know, from a technical perspective, in competency, obviously, you need to be able to use the tools that are out there. 
in the market today, you know, red, 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 red is not made, but red is mature tool that's in the built environments and digital construction right now. But tech is also there for social design, sketch up architect for architects, etc. Goal, picking the right tool is transferring useful information to the delivery team. So whatever that might be from a visualization perspective or a data perspective. Collaborative mindset, collab, collab, collab. And so having that means kind of data sharing and coordination. So open BIM is, you know, I used to be termed as BIM level three. So open BIM is getting a big push again now. There are lots of vendors who are driving towards this interoperability. Even the main big vendors are uh, the big players, I guess, are trying to make their platforms open and accessible to other, to other tools as well. And, and IFC is making a big comeback, I would say. It's been around for a while, but IFC 4 now, which has been recognized as a European standard file format, is making a big comeback. Building Smart is really pushing that again. And then BCF, which is building collaboration format, is also one for issue resolution. Mm -hmm. These formats are there. So if you're developing a digital skill set, be familiar with these formats and how to use them and how they can actually help deliver what the client wants. Um, and then so database model. So, Understanding the difference between the information model versus the 3D model. So, you know, in simple terms, I mean, it's a very crude thing to say, but you could do BIM without a 3D model, you can have 3D models without a BIM. So it's, it's important to understand the differentiation for us too. So coordination and classification is, is, is a classic one, I would say, but what I want to talk about from a design team perspective is, is clash avoidance. So before the handover from design team in a traditional builds from a design team to ourselves as the main contractor, we would love to know that this avoidance process is taking place. We know that we're going to get a design model that's in relatively good condition. So our clash detection is, is limited because that takes time. That takes time. So clash avoidance, main contractors can work with design teams to go through some kind of early, early engagement. Again, contracts dictate this stuff, but for true collaboration and, you know, a reduced time around the project, that clash avoidance prior to sharing information is really important. And then you can have, sorry, spelling error there, uh, iterative design once you get this avoidance. So smoother hand over to ourselves or anybody else. That's our advice, which is not like, just makes sense. Uh, and then a little bit on standardization. So formats, naming conventions, just this is a big part of building information management. So people with a kind of a, a data based background uh, will, will flourish here. But the idea behind that is, is standardization. Some people love standardization. Some people are a little bit more by it, but it's still critical for that flow of information. If the standard is set early on, what formats are we doing yes, or what formats are we using? What is our naming convention? And then we can analyze those and validate information as it goes through. That's not pretty boring, but it's absolutely key. So to move on to the contractor then, so you know, the main contractor so contractor are both both kind of reference here. Um uh, they yeah, just keep an eye on my tiger because I've got to stack my body. <laughs> so, um, so contractors, main contractors. So the skill that's required at that level. So again, BIM awareness. And by awareness, I mean here, you know, uh, everybody's familiar with BIM. Everybody understands the acronym and version of it, et cetera. Uh, ISO 19650, people think that, okay, it's just a change in terminology from as it implemented to. There are some other little nuanced changes there, but I think the, the important thing to understand is a lot of subcontractors and contractors who are not BIM ready are doing brush, a version of BIM already. So the standard itself, it aligns with construction delivery. It's about digitizing construction delivery. It's not about creating this brand new way to do construction. It's just standardizing the road for the delivery. So if you follow the clause, it's true, you know, leadership, roles and responsibility, setting up the digital environment, blah, blah, blah. A lot of companies are doing this already. So it's just an opportunity to just standardize it and have something consistent to follow. And like I mentioned as well, you know, a bit of digital, there's some tremendous resources out there for ways to get set up and uh, ways to kind of make yourself aware of what the standard is about. The email task group, it's kind of future that web is amazing. Uh, the, the information they have out there about data and information management. And then you've got some private companies, Hopper, I put that one in there. So that's run by Paul Shinkoff, the guy who actually wrote the ISO. Um, and it's interesting, he wrote the standard, but he doesn't really refer to the standard in his it's actually it's very interesting. It just talks about the kind of the essence of what this information management flow is all about. Model integration, please deliver detailed 3D models, but only to the LOD responsibility matrix. So, you know, follow 
bottle of that LOD uh, is required if you run the project. And for companies who need more information on that, the BIM form was just recently released uh, another updated spec on LOD. So, you know, it's an uh, interesting reading. Uh, and, um, and it can help inform your kind of BIM enablement as well. So, but yeah, details, really models. And again, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. That's what the model is all about. It's visualizing issues. It's already representation of the design, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the important thing to remember there is for anybody who has a digital skill set or digital mindset from the construction industry, you are coming in to be a builder yourself. You are going to be a You're not just going to sit in the corner anymore. There is no, there are very few kind of just big teams now or, or, you know, just technicians sitting in the corner, maybe at some larger organizations. But at least the way we look at things, we want people in our digital group to be builders. And we want them to be able to share that kind of digital knowledge. Of. So use the model, but only in the context of what we're actually trying to do on site. So yeah, the digital skills then separate from, we'll say, BIM or, or construction. And there are lots of collaboration communication tools out there. People who have an understanding of how these simple tools work will make a big impact in these companies who want to uh, digital transfers, uh, digital transformation and visualization. And it's the most digitalized issue. And uh, so, you know, Microsoft Lists, Slack, one, make sure that all people will be familiar with those two. But then some other ones that are out there are stuff like Morta. Morta is an interesting tool, which is an online way for kind of a collaboration platform, which will pull information from all of your different CDEs and tools on a project and centralize them into one location. So, if you're somebody who's sick of using Excel and tractors and stuff, this tool will pull it all in there together. And it also makes it transparent. Everybody else can see the information. Funny how transparent you see that. And, and then they launch an Irish based company who are really focused on interoperability, stitching these CDs together to make the both fit. So, then see platforms, you know, we'll talk about then be aware of them, I, know, I, I guess, because, you know, companies want to go through a big, a big stage of digitizing add on information. And that might be just down to scanning PDF documents and then using some better technology to make the data. Especially with the RWA that I was talking about earlier on. There's going to be a lot of that work. There's a lot of paper documents floating around or independent documents or uh, etc. So there's going to be a lot of digitizing of that analog information. And then the contribution. So, you know, in German church style, what is your contribution to the project? Whatever that contribution is, whatever your scope is, make sure the information is accurate and is up to date. So if there are changes, you need to be aware. First, you know, there's there's an onus on the client who designed you, the main contractor to share that information, but all contractors should be actively seeking out changes and kind of integrating themselves in the project to do And challenge those main, challenge us better processes. We definitely don't have all the best processes. In place. We're still learning, we're still developing as well. So if you're somebody, subcontractor who's got a better idea for Testing or auditing your own, you know, you, you are required as part of the standard when you test and audit your own information before you actually share it up into, into the rest of the delivery team. So not everybody's doing that. So here's an opportunity to really show off. So that's the skill. So then credentials, you know, there's there's probably I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here. Everybody's familiar with uh big assessments, you know, how to enable companies to get up to speed and actually be able to participate in this in this kind of digital construction environment. So CPIX assessments have been around for a while, but it's a great document to start this kind of collaborative process between main contractors and, and subcontractors to hear it. That's what I have experienced. So the way it's broken out then is, is it asks you, do you have a willingness to exchange models and data? It's a good question to start off with when you're starting with a subcontractor saying, will you give us your information? Uh, and if there are any answers no in that section, then it, at least you can start a discussion. You talk about the APA opportunities, the shit in the We talked a little bit about the 12 areas of BIM, which, you know, BIM is now kind of, like if you look at some of these, there's a mixture of digital construction, there's a mixture of visualization, a mixture of information management, but it just kind of lists them out to give the main contractor an opportunity to show the subcontractor what, what opportunities are there, and then for the subcontractors come back and say, we can help you here with life cycle assessment. We can help you here with some of the rehearsals that we're going to want to do with some equipment site, et cetera, et cetera. So you start the conversation. Then project experience it is, you know, it's everybody wants to mitigate a risk. You don't want to hire somebody who has a cue what they're doing. 
And if you don't have a clue what they're doing, now is the time to, to say, we don't have experience with this, can you help us? And we push, push, but, 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 but at least from the outset, you know, you know, somebody has experience with that. And that kind of feeds into the gate for the students. There is a discussion. We, we want, you know, we want to work with a lot of different supply chain partners that some may not be technically strong or digitally strong, but their delivery and their time management and their cost management is just excellent. So, you know, it doesn't just, it's not going to rule you out. We want to be able to. So then the modern construction profession, what is that? So it really is a hybrid skill set. It is a great, you know, some of us have about this before. We're, we're in a digital age and we're flying, flying ahead here. And we don't want to forget that the most important technical skill is, is understanding delivery. Uh, yes, staff is important. You know, understanding objectives and following them out and tracking is important. But understanding construction methodology is also important. Regardless of your role on the project, you should add an understanding of, of what wow, is it. Construction is a real cultural thing. It's a real team environment. You will really flourish if you're able to be in those meetings and understand what people are talking about. And then you can go away and really develop additional solutions to support them. Everybody's familiar nowadays with consumer level technology. And construction digital solutions now are becoming as easy to use as consumer level technology. I've got some apps in my phone there that anybody, anybody here could use. And that's not a side of anybody here. It's more so that it's just. It's that same way all consumer level technology is developed. Phone screens, wiping, da da da, it's very easy to follow. So, you know, become familiar with those that happen quickly is what construction principles fix for longer. Soft skills communication. If you're somebody with a digital mindset going into the industry and you want to help the construction experts, some of the sort of footy duties get over the line, you're going to have to learn how to communicate by this is what you will for that. Show them that. Pull out your phone, pull out your tablet. Show them how well this thing works, but particularly how it helps address the challenge. What is it this? Adaptability uh, again. So that you was talking about. So you should understand what's on the market. Sales agents. There's a lot of startups now. We're trying to make themselves extremely relevant. Here's why you need our solution. Here's why you need to pay us lots of money to do it. And um, just understand what's out there. Some of them are excellent, but they may not be required for what you're trying to do, or they may not fit with your team. But, you know, we're going to get into stuff like data warehouse, blockchain. You know, blockchain has been around for a while now. With, with 3.0, well, it's been around for a short while. Cryptocurrency, people might be familiar with, but it's going to start coming into procurement process and the infrastructure as well. It's that smart contracts. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's called a trustless environment, which means it doesn't mean that you can't trust it, it means you don't actually trust it. So you're basically putting stuff on, on the web, on the chain, that my work is done here, I want to get a page. And that's going to start coming into construction. Uh, DAOs, decentralized, autonomous organizations are also on the way. Same, same kind of, same thing for field. But again, your adaptability requires design thinking. Jeremy was talking about empathy. That's a huge part of design thinking. It's step number one in design thinking. If you're building digital solutions, if you're building any new process, you need to start with them. Understand what what's broken. If there's nothing broken and we're just trying to innovate, you have to be able to communicate that to people that you thought. And understand they're not just going to die down and take it. They're going to come back and say, Well, things are not doing too bad at all. So why should I change this? Um, so kind of meet them halfway with that empathetic mindset. And then you're just talking about documenting prototyping, etc. That's design making. I mentioned agile there. Like we're in the software world now. Lots of these vendors are software companies and they do sprints. Let's do two weeks, talk about what you want, then review after two weeks, make some changes, do another two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's kind of added to that sprints that they enjoy the rest. Just how familiar with that way of working. And then finally, for adaptability, walk the sites, get out there. I tend to the guys in my team all the time. Don't sit behind the computer all day. Get up, get out, go outside, go for a walk. You will, I guarantee you, see something you can expect to see. But also participate in those planning meetings. Sit in there. You don't have to put your hand up all the time and say, hey, I wish I was going to whatever, but, but learn what's going on on the sites. Learn, learn the little. Uh, and then uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation. So what, what can academia do? So this, this is not me just uh, slamming down on academia at all. I think academia has done a great job, but there's definitely a partnership between academia and private or public that and it needs to flourish and move forward in this digital environment. So to me, you know, the curriculum needs to be enhanced by combining 
construction principal courses, construction management and engineering, et cetera, with the technical tools. And not just having module and principles and then module on the tools. Do the module on principles and show them how the tool can deliver on those principles. So uh, that's kind of a, that's the interdisciplinary approach I'm talking about. But you can stand the data management, and there's a bit of data analysis in there as well. So these courses need to develop to, to contain those. Uh, so, yeah, so graduates are one of them there. Like right now, we take a lot of graduates from, from <laughs> well, we take a lot of graduates in there kind of just before their final year, bring them in, we show them what we do, send them back, and then typically they come back and it's after that final year as well. So those programs work pretty well. And final, the final slide I have here basically is just talking through some of those tools again, from the pictures required in the middle here. Picking the right tools, lots of big tools, big tools out there now. Uh, picking that right tool. So you've got the technical platforms, all of us are, are always there as a, as a sure suite of tools. Redland's really found space in the market. It's ability to collaborate with the cloud is kind of, it's on one parallel really, but there are, there are other tools catching up. <laughs> um, so there are alternatives as well. Obviously, you know, I mentioned tech, uh, for, for smoking engineers, et cetera. Uh, Arctic Brickscan is another big one from, from Brixis, which is another company as well. They're developing a big tool. It's, it's 3D modeling, but you can incorporate that into it also. Uh, but then beyond just those classic platforms, Power BI is, Power BI is a big one to represent data. Power BI, there, again, there are small companies out there who can connect your rental model to Power BI or any other model for that, for that matter. Where you can represent that data and see it in a better environment and the exhibit good insights. Um, there are other companies that I've seen builder is a very expensive solution that we use for site setting up, planning, and basic scheduling and logistics. But yeah, again, all the rest of the ones here are familiar in terms of collaboration platforms, ACC, Autodesk, Pro or Trimble Connect. You know, there's lots of options out there. It's about finding one that's the right tool. You know, we, we use tools that enable us on site as well as enable us at the, at the doctor management level. And, but like they're all, they're all as good as each other. If you don't have a lot of with each other. Revisto and BigFlab, these are other major tools that are developing now, especially Revisto. It's both suite in and of itself, which is, you know, it manages data. It's, it's classic for coordination and, and, uh, and, model management and visualization, but it's all about communications and collaboration. That's what that entire platform is all about, that entire tool. And they're really doing well in the market. So you know, we use it through a couple of projects. So again, uh, be familiar with those tools. And then just find a then on, on data security, security and privacy. Like, we, we use lots of tools. We entertain lots of tools, as do lots of other companies as well. Just got to be careful. If you do start using some of these tools, Shout out to DPIA, which is a, a data protection impact assessment, which is all about managing risk and mitigating risk. So, simply put, how you're controlling personal data. So if you if you got these online based platforms, web based platforms, and you've got pieces usernames and banks and phone numbers and stuff in there, you have to do DPIA because there's a data breach risk, etc. So you know. Maybe we don't really need to uh, GDPR, maybe obviously to look, look at these, these data, but it's just to protect yourself and obviously to protect all those users and personal data as well. So, uh, I don't know where I am. Thank you. Thank you.